Good afternoon and welcome to everyone in this uh, fifth appointment, this session of the um, IMLR German Philosophy Seminar. Uh, we continue to explore the ways that the scholarship of Martin Buber uh, shows its relevance today and uh, across a variety of topics. Um, I, am, uh, I apologize for the inconvenience uh, that, uh, we, that we had last time, like two weeks ago, we had to cancel our appointment. So we are resuming now with uh, with a speaker that is uh, Marcus Holside. And uh, Marcus Holside not only have has uh, already joined last year our our seminar where we explore the dialogical uh, philosophy of Martin Buber, uh, but he's also a practitioner of structural democratic dialogue of which he will uh, talk a bit. We're going to be introduced to uh, structural democratic dialogue today. And uh, in fact, let me just um, start with um, introduce the topic of today. Uh, the leading question that we will face today, that we will deal with today is whether uh, Buberian dialogue, the way uh, Buber envisaged and conceived dialogue, uh, could be um, useful to contribute to participatory democracy with a particular focus on the role of social media and online interaction, um, the way we usually uh, frame and understand online interactions is uh, that they tend to be quite objectifying, reifying, uh, but perhaps they also offer some opportunities uh, to connect people and uh, hopefully to realize uh, what uh, in, in, in what is dialogue in a Bavarian sense is the leading question for today. Um, before I um, hand it over to uh, Marcus, a couple of uh, practical things. Um, if you could all um, mute yourself, yourselves while um, the, the host speaker is presenting, it would be great. And uh, the session is recorded, and I hope everyone is okay with uh, the, um, the recording going on, um, so that it can be uploaded afterwards on the IMLR website. Um, and if you have uh, questions, please do uh, use the chat. At, uh, and of course, at the end of the um, presentation by Marcus, um, there's going to be a Q&A session where we can freely discuss uh, what has been presented and uh, the texts that were sent out as uh, readings for uh, for today. Um, yeah, I think it's all. Uh, Johan, is there any other thing to add? Or I, I think that's 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 everything that we needed to get yeah. out of the way before we can start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll hand it over to Marcus for uh, the presentation, and many thanks and welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Great. Very well. Thanks, Federico and Johan, for inviting me to present today. I am afraid that my presentation will not be as erudite as the one from Federico of two weeks ago, or three weeks ago. Um, but I, I do appreciate this opportunity to explain to you uh, the concepts that are the basis of something called structured democratic dialogue which is, um, as I put it in this presentation, a small and exploratory step forward to adopting Buberian principles in the world of online communications. But let me start with, with what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to cover deliberative and de participatory democracy, what it is, how does it work, and why it is important. And then I'm going to try and ask if there's a role for Buberian dialogue in deliberative democracy. Um, by asking what is Buberian dialogue, what do we mean by it? And some questions that I don't think we've really addressed up to now. Can it happen virtually? Is it only possible between two people or, or can it happen in a group? And can dialogue be contemplated over other electronic means, for example, email? Obviously, when Buber lived, he spent a lot of time writing letters, which I think could be considered very much to be part of the dialogical process. 
But can we say that that could continues over email today? I'm not sure. And as I said at the end, I want to do a little presentation of what is structured democratic dialogue and, and try and tie that into, into some of the challenges we will discuss as we go forward today. Let's start first with deliberative and participatory democracy. All right. In both deliberative and participatory democracy, we find citizens playing a, st a starring role. In both systems, citizens are empowered to let their voices be heard and to weigh in on the way their community is governed. However, one of the main barriers to deliberation is the complexity of the process, which makes it difficult to scale and reproduce online. And that's something we've learned from the structured democratic dialogue process. Scaling and scaling online is, is quite complex. Our digital tools today are usually designed for participation. They aim to reach large number of citizens and are geared towards action, vote, uh, likes and other dislikes, but they don't really allow meaningful in-depth in de debate or dialogue. Ooh, sorry. If we look Apologies, I'm working with two, two screens here and the line is bothering me. Okay, sorry. If we did discuss the deli deliberative democracy and interpersonal communication, we find that there, there's a gap that we need to bridge um, in order to facilitate deliberative scenarios. And we really need to pay more attention to the sociological core of deliberative democracy, which is main, namely interpersonal communication. Dialogue scholarship has gained momentum over the past decades offering a way forward in terms of enlarging the concept of deliberation while enriching its processes. But are we perhaps at a crossroads of political science and communication scholarship? The last decades have shown an increased interest in discourses that are at the core of the 21st century democracy. Dialogue, deliberation, citizen participation, collaborative policy making, or public engagement. However, there is a need to study, to of studying interpersonal communication processes that underpin, underpin the materialization of such discourses. Can we stimulate debate about the forms of communication that are dominant in the public sphere, arguing their inadequacy for the practical advance of the deliberative idea? If we look at participative assemblies, many governments have resorted to initiatives aimed at opening spaces for citizen participation. Decision makers usually choose the issues carefully, managing the balance between risk and benefit, setting in the agenda and limiting the scope of such participatory processes. One of the challenges of Guberian debate is that we cannot determine the outcome in advance. Therefore, by allowing ourselves as a government organization to adopt a process of debate, which is not, not focused in any one way, we have to accept that the outcome can be not exactly as perhaps we thought it would be. There have been significant examples that contradict the usual critique that these spaces are exclusively open for decisions on peripheral issues. In 2004, there was an assembly of quasi-randomly chosen citizens in the Canadian province of British Columbia that was charged with the task of analysing and, if appropriate, proposing a reform of the electrical system that would afterwards, afterwards be submitted to a referendum and subsequent legislation. But this and other assemblies of a similar kind, for example, the Irish Assembly on uh, abortion some some years ago, are really the arch, archetype of this sort of process, a focus on institutional, procedural and consensual dimensions. 
the attention to the communicative texture of the process takes a secondary place. A number of authors have stressed that the need to complement the analysis of the conditions for deliberation with the investigation of what a deliberation process creates from the perspective of its communication patterns on the ground. That is to say, the study of the institutional procedure and consensual conditions for deliberative democracy must take into account the interpersonal communication dynamics that shape citizens' participation. Personal interaction constitutes the hard core of the institutional deliberative macro processes. In other words, the democratic quality of these processes will depend on the quality of the interpersonal practices which they crystallize. And this perhaps reflects a certain unease at the difficult task of shifting deliberation scholarship from its theoretical safe havens to its practical challenges. I'd like to consider for uh, some moments the role of language. The conception of language as a mere instrument that represents objective realities is still predominant within the view of communication as a neutral medium of social exchange. However, language is not a neutral instance. It does not represent things, but constitutes them and their relationships. Language has a constitutive quality that provides the world with its meaning, structuring our ways of understanding and constructing the world around us through complex sense-making processes. Murray Edelman stated that language is not an instrument to express politics, but language constructs and hence is politics. For instance, the language used by policymakers to frame a so social problem often implies a specific diagnosis of its causes and hence a particular set of actions to be taken. Edelman illustrated how the label welfare recipient was used in the USA's public discourse in the 1970s to connot a lack of a work ethic, laziness, and the aspiration of the underclass to take illegitimate advantage of the social security system. Such vocabularies prevailed and contributed to shape the social perceptions on which the Reagan era was based, and also the Thatcherite one in the UK. Another example of how language is far from being a neutral instrument could be found in the expressions used by the British press during the 1991 war against Iraq. The construction of the internal and external enemies of a country is a fertile terrain for the study of the social and political impact of specific language games in mainstream public discourse and policy. I'm sure that Buber himself would have been horrified at the use of the word terrorism to describe almost everything which happens in Israel um, as not a way of encouraging debate, but a way of stopping it. Edelman has explained how language is interwoven with actions in shaping our social and individual cognitive structures, as well as in nurturing the negotiation of the meanings that we attach to social or political phenomena. We also have to look at the unintended consequences of confrontational polarization. Um, we need to look, I think, at the difference between the results and consequences. Uh, for example, there was a local plan to build a new school in Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland. Two parties were formed within the community and two local campaigns took place supporting the two preferred options. The local authorities took part in polarizing dynamic the dynamic of the process, trying to minimize the political costs of the decision, as well as mediating between both options, while attempting to carry on their own provisional agenda. The process was complex, and one of the options won the battle after the council favored the recommendation made at the end of a formal consultation procedure. Eventually, the winning side celebrated its triumph, while the losing side remained active, concentrating its current its efforts to slow down the construction process. Here was a missed opportunity in terms of fostering a deliberative process with spaces for constructive forms of communication within the community. This gains relevance if we take into account that even the participants whose option triumphed acknowledged that, that being satisfied with the result 
but not with its consequences. The spiral of confrontational communication left behind a legacy of division and resentment in the community, an environment in which not only was un it was un unpleasant to interact in the neighborhood, but also anticipated the way in which future issues would be dealt with. This is an example of communication understood as an instrument, and it produced results which will be interpreted as either satisfactory or not by the citizens involved. In contrast, communication understood as a relational process, and we'll come back to that when we're talking of Bavarian dialogue, will have consequences in terms of interpersonal relationships, and hence with regard to the communicative dynamics that will characterize the development of the community. Moving forward, we can, we can expand this onto the, in discussing the argument culture. A considerable part of communication in democratic societies is characterized by what Tannen called the argument of culture, which urges us, to, urges us to approach the world and the people in it in an adversarial frame of mind. It rests on the assumption that opposition is the best way to get anything done. The best way to discuss an idea is to set up a debate the best way to cover news is to find spokespeople who express the most extreme polarized view and prevent them as both sides. The best way to settle disputes is litigation that pits one party against the other. The best way to begin an essay is to attack someone. And the best way to show you're really thinking is to criticize. This is not to deny that social reality is conflictive, but to assert that the way conflict is often dealt with might be counterproductive and self-perpetuating. It does not allow deep treatment of the issues under discussion, but a ritualized opposition that reinforces dramatic antagonizing, like antagonism, hindering the possibility of dynamics that foster inquiry into underlying complexity, the argument culture contributes to blocking dialogic converse, conversations, transforming them into entrenched monologues. It is also apparent that polarized, polarized debate based on adversarial and confrontational communication is most definitely not the best way to deal with any or every organizational, social and political issue. If we take into account in areas such as local and community development, energy policy, environmental sustainability, health policy, education, and so on, it seems appropriate to ask how well suited is a familiar bipolar model in a culture whose increasing diversity has dramatically increased the number of voices and perspectives that demand to be heard. Continuing the battle of arguments, there is an endless list of public arenas where this will simply not produce the triumph of the best reasons. Abortion and euthanasia, civil civic liberties, gay and lesbian rights, by technology, multicultural, and to name but a few obvious examples. In many cases, multiple reasons are not only present, but legitimate, despite the fact that rarely all of the different voices are heard or even articulated. All in all, what is under question is not debate and argumentation per se, but the context of blind opposition, using that opposition to accomplish every goal, even those that do not require fighting, but might also better be accomplished by other means, such as exploring, expanding, discussion, investigating, and exchanges of ideas, suggested by the word dialogue. It is important to point out that the role of this spectacle, that this spectacle plays in the formation of public opinion in terms of shaping ideas, attitudes and actions, not only with regard to the content, but also to the form of communication, it's consensual how. Indeed, confrontational communication is not exclusive patrimony of the political and media spectacle, in occasion that may also impregnate the deliberative microprocess in which citizens participate. Contentious public discourse becomes a model for behavior and sets the tone of how individuals experience their relationships to each other and the society, something which we are very aware of in, in the Twitter and Facebook society that we all live in. 
If we now take some time to look at deliberative theories and dialogical studies and the practices, we find that communication networks and microenvironments do not provide safe havens for substantial deliberation. It is necessary to create alternative spaces and experimental dynamics that allow communication to go beyond the ritualized opposition of the argument culture. Can we find ways of enriching the communication fabric of public debate with deliberative theories and dialogic studies and practices? And as we move forward in this presentation, I hope to be able to show that structured democratic dialogue is addressing these, these needs. Oops, sorry. Stuart and Zedeker distinguish between two conceptual streams within dialogical communication scholarship. The description, the descriptive, inspired by Batkin, undersized dialogue as a defining quality of human beings. The irreducible, social, relational, or interrelational character of all human meaning making, and thus postulates the inherently dialogic character of all human life. Second, we have the prescriptive approach, where dialogue is a communicative ideal achieved through principled practices to foster a special kind of contact. Classic thinkers here are Buber and the physicist Bob. If we look at the table in the next slide, we see this in a kind of tabular form, whereas the Bohm-based dialogue is a form of collaborative, non-polarized polarized discourse, uh, which is amplified and provides for amplified and inclusive perspectives of even with the tensions of disagreement, uh, allows for participants' per, per exploration of common ground and difference, and in practice focuses on learning, unpacking assumptions, and facilitating communication. And as opposed to, or in complement to, the barbarian approach to a relational spec, a relational space which builds on frankness, trust, presence, and understanding emerging from shared humanity. And it's a state of high quality mutuality. The table we're now looking at offers a synthesis to illustrate some key contrasts between discursive practices of adversarial and dialogic communication. The left column it represents dynamics that are typically appear in public relations campaigns, ad adversary coalitions, and party politics, media debates, and traditional policy making processes. In contrast, the right column focuses on principles and practice that underpin a dialogical orientation to public dialogue and deliberation, and illustrates some of the common themes shared by dialogue and deliberative scholarship. When communicating dialogically, we can, one can listen, which is of course very important, ask direct questions, present one ideas, argue, debate, and so forth. The defining characteristic of dialogic communication is that all of these speech acts are done in ways that holds one's own position, but allows others the space to hold theirs, are profoundly open to hearing, and the emphasis on hearing others' positions without needing to oppose or assimilate them. When communicating dialogically, participants often have important agendas and purposes, but make them inseparable from their relationship in the moment with others who have equally strong or perhaps conflicting agendas and purposes. Creating spaces for dialogic communication is an evolving craft rather than a fixed technique. It requires discipline and time, and it demands a willingness to reflect on communication habits and power relationships, as well as the determination to experience different ways of relating to each other. The unpredictable nature of dialogue, its fluid structure and open-endedness have made critics question its role within the deliberative process. They fear that too much emphasis on dialogue diminishes the roles of classic models of advocacy, which contribute to challenging the dominant cultural vocabularies and meanings, thus opening new dimensions for debate. It is useful to separate methodological, spatially and temporarily, the process of dialogue and deliberation. 
In the, in the end, the purpose of deliberation is to debate options and to make decisions about them, whereas dialogue deals with inquiry relationship and collective thinking. To illustrate this, this distinction of objectives and ways of orienting the conversation, Escobar provides the table we are seeing now, where advocacy and inquiry in deliberation and deliberative dialogue compared with debate and dialogue in process which is not oriented to decision making. Now, when we discuss structured democratic dialogue, we are most definitely approaching this from the, from the concept of deliberative dialogue. And I'd like to try and address Buberian dialogue and how this fits into what we have been discussing up to now. And let me try and, and provide my and other views of Buberian dialogue. I think the Buberian dialogue is a protest against the dehumanization, depersonalization, and the objectification of man. It's the confirmation of one's responsibility for the other. Being, not seeming, this is what I have in mind, what do you think? To yield to seeming is man's essential cowardice. To resist it is his essential courage. It also includes confirmation, awareness, and personal presence. Awareness of the uniqueness of the other. Imagining concretely what the other person thinks, wills, and desires. Confirmation of the other as a bearer of his own ideas. Barbarian dialogue is an unfolding, not as imposition, that helps the other unmask and unwrap his potentialities. It is the response of one holds being to the, other, the otherness of the other and an agent of change, especially in those magic moments of Barbarian dialogue where one really appreciates the power of the thou relationship. Moving from I-it to i thou relationships, in the, together with the idea of dialogue, we find the relationship of I-it to the world as immediate and non-instrumental, not as an instrument for achieving a specific goal. i thou is about presence and exists in the lived, lived present moment, coming into existence through the other, the thou, being present. Sylvia Richter points out that for Buber, Recognizing the other means recognizing the other's uniqueness and individuality. When relating to a mass of people, either does not relate to the group or the mass, but looks for the person within the mass and transforms the mass into individuals. Um, I think this was what Gruber was stating when he addressed the question to the individual. The us versus them dynamic of societal polarization is precisely what treats the others as part of such a mass, be they governments, conspiracy theorists, racists, or others. Relating to single individuals, I thou dialogues need to satisfy three conditions. From appearances to being, authenticity in Authenticity in dialogue requires being, not appearing in a certain way. Personal presentation of the other, presentification of the other, sorry. Focus on the other as a person, not on their opinions or positions. And from imposition to opening up to the other, propaganda versus education. From the political to the social principle. Buber identifies in many of his writings a central tension between the political principle and the social principle. While agreeing that power is a present in all of our social structure, he denies that this is the most fundamental element. Fundamental to Buber is the social principle, people being or entering into relationships with other, horizontal movement as opposed to vertical movement of power. This is very important because it helps us develop the relationships of trust which are the basic component of Barbarian relationships and dialogue. 
Social principles govern the various ways in which human beings stand in relationships to each other and where these relationships create shared experiences and reactions. Viewing the political principle as fundamental means viewing the official structure of the state and determining human existence as if human beings are made for the state rather than vice versa. And much of the kind of uh, participatory democracy that we see today is being determined by the state as to how the participation of citizens should come about, top down rather than bottom up. The citizens explain to the state how they want to participate. The social principle would suggest that the more fundamental level of human relationships by initiatives that create, strengthen and form these relationships. Truth. And I'm, I'm coming here a little bit to truth as emet in Hebrew versus truth as faith um, in other contexts. In the context of a spoken dialogue, speaking the truth for Buber means three kinds of faithfulness. First, faithfulness with respect to an existing reality upon which, as Buber expresses it, the window of language is opened. Second, faithfulness with respect to the person addressed, who is meant as a concrete person, actually present. And thirdly, faithfulness with respect to the speaker, in the sense that the speaker says what he means, and he means what he is, that is. What he means is tied to his personal existence and moved beyond appearances of being to being and authenticity. A consequence of this conception of truth is that truth occurs in the spoken word and is nothing to be owned or to possessed. But while truth cannot be possessed, it is something which, which we can enter into a living relationship. And as an aside, um, Buber, I believe, and I stand to be corrected in this, saw the development of Christianity out of Judaism as a development from the notion of faith as trust to the notion of faith as belief in a certain state of affairs. But I'm happy to continue that in the dialogue. For the, today's readers, Buber's text, The Crisis and the Truth, sounds like an appropriate description of our current post-truth age. Dating from 1945, Buber describes here that the, at the interior of the crisis in which he sees to be in spreading over humanity is the person without truth, the man who believes, refuses to believe that there is a truth. What Buber's analysis comes down to is the claim that the crisis of truth is really a crisis of trust. And hence, it should be addressed by using a notion of truth that is about establishing trust and truthfulness in an age of mistrust. I think that's very, very relevant to the world which we're living in today and becomes more relevant every day. Such a conception of truth can help with, with, with descriptive polarization, polarization around facts and fake, fake news. Buber's notion of truth suggests that information campaigns and fact checkers will not be successful, at least not sufficient, in addressing alternative facts or fake news. The reason that truth conceived of as unconcealing of reality does not help when the people of institutions doing the unconcealing are not trusted. Faithfulness to the world is only one of the three kinds of faithfulness involved in truth. What is left out is the interpersonal aspect of faithfulness, which can be achieved only through initiatives that create trust. An example of what such initiatives might look for in the area of conspiracy theories, some philosophers have argued that the creation of communities of inquiry where various kinds of expertise around a particular conspiracy theory are brought together from both adherents and critics of the theory if these were to be communities in the sense of Buber, they would generate the kind of trust needed to overcome descriptive polar polarization. I hope to, to show in the last section of this approach that perhaps the moving towards the direction of the structured democratic dialogue could help to achieve these kind of outcomes. 
An example of an institution fitting well with Buber's concept of conception of truth is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission established in South Africa to deal with the country's past under the apartheid regime. The aim of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was to discover the truth concerning wrongdoings under apartheid by setting up public hearings that involved victims telling their stories, often in front of the perpetrators. In these interactions, the three aspects of the faithfulness associated with Buber's notion of truth could be seen to be at work. Okay, I would now like to, to, to take this opportunity to, to explain a little bit about the way in which we think we can move this forward. And structured democratic dialogue is really implementing the dream of an internet agora. A place where humanity can harness collective intelligence and wisdom that today is clearly morphing into the nightmare populated by opportunists to exploit short attention spans, fake news and hatred. The vision of an online structured democratic process is to kindle new scientific thinking capable of radically transforming current internet participation into a true space for dialogue and deliberation, where the benefits of authentic and structured face-to-face -face interactions will be implemented, opening the possibilities to contribute to a higher level of participatory democracy. The ambition is to enable stakeholders. Stakeholders by stakeholders, we mean the people who are impacted by societal decisions to address complex policy, social, economic, and social technical challenges that require collective understanding and wise implementation decisions supported by the, by the participants. Structured democratic dialogue is grounded on the thesis of the theory that complex socio-technical challenges require the harnessing of collective intelligence and wisdom of the people who are, inf who are influenced by any decisions taken. An axiom station, it is unethical to try to change any socio-technical system without the explicit permission and participation of those whose lives will be implemented by any changes. SCD attempts to establish an environment of trust where academics, students, citizens, administrators and experts with diverse views and, and representing different ethnic and gender backgrounds can jointly reflect on the complex and very real issues behind topics such as inequality, ethnic and gender discrimination, climate change and reach consensus and agreement on the steps they must jointly take to address the challenges within their own institutions. An SCD workshop can facilitate spaces to have honest and open dialogues about students and academics who are impacted by, react to, and can address this challenge in an environment that encourages inclusivity, diversity, and innovation alongside curiosity, skepticism, humor, and compassion. Participants in genuine dialogue become more aware and better understand their own preconceptions and weaknesses a form of self-trust, and by entering into relationships of confidence and empathy, they can learn to respect the constraints and vulnerabilities of fellow participants in a form which is really a form of mutual trust. Let me, let me quickly take into account the process overview of an SDD process. STD has been proven in hundreds of instances where it's been done using face-to-face -face dialogue using the process I'm about to explain. Over the last few years, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have been, we've been experimenting with online dialogues using similar processes and the technology which is known to all of us, Zoom, uh, electronic voting and the like. However, the scaling up of STD is the challenge 
that we really need to address because where we can easily handle 20, 25 people and deal with the process which is generated by the ideas and the interactions of these people, we cannot provide an environment where hundreds or even thousands of people can decide to enter into debates or dialogues over the internet amongst themselves and, and even poll each other for the ideas which they would like to enter into dialogue. The SD, in order to focus the SDD process, it's launched with a triggering question, which kind of things which would come up are, what are the characteristics of an ideal future scenario? What obstacles do we face as we try to? Or what actions, policies, measures can we take to remove obstacles that we have identified to enable us to reach a societal goal? The way it works is basically once we have this triggering question, we create an environment where the participants are asked to, in, to participate in dialogue, which are one-on-one -on -one dialogues, but, but not long-term dialogues. These are short dialogues where they question each other on a set of ideas, but they don't criticize these ideas. They merely ask the person who has presented the idea to the group to better explain or to further explain the idea. And this is where the dialogue begins. So they are speaking to somebody who has presented an idea, requesting clarification, and maybe one clarification or more clarifications. But in the process of clarification, they begin to understand where that person is coming from in his idea. The next thing which happens in a structured democratic dialogue is that these ideas are clustered or grouped into sets of ideas. So if an idea is associated around improving education in, within the organization, then the ideas which we could be dealing with 20, 30, 40 or 50 ideas altogether, but maybe eight or 10 of them relate to education can be clustered into, the, into this cluster called education. We then ask the participants to vote, to choose the five of the most important ideas which they have so far discussed and had clarified. And we take all of the ideas which receive more than two votes and go through a process of what we call structure, structuring, which is an inter interdeputative structural modeling where we actually compare these ideas, but not all of the ideas all at one time, because people find it very difficult to keep in their mind even 20 or 30 ideas. We compare them using an algorithm one at, two, one at a time, one idea against the other idea. And what we ask is, if we were to implement idea A, would that make it easier for us to implement idea B? Or would it help to achieve the objective of idea B. And the algorithm works out how to present these ideas so we don't have to present a matrix of 20 by 20 ideas, but based on a, uh, uh, and the algorithm, we can present the ideas which are the most likely to need to be discussed amongst the participants. And at the end of this, we produce a roadmap, a set of recommendations, um, a method of moving forward. There are a set of rules which we use underlying this process of structured democratic dialogue. The first one is the rule of requisite variety. And this requirement requires that the organizers ensure that those invited to participate and contribute their observations, their ideas, represent as much as possible the entire spectrum of perspectives, conflicting points of views, ideas, and more importantly, interests. So we are starting our dialogue, our, our structured dialogue, with a, a, a wide representation of the people who need to be in the room to participate in that dialogue. Sorry? Mm. Now I've done what I was trying not to do with my notes. Let me get back to where I should be. The next note, the next requirement or requisite is we call requisite parsimony. 
The short-term memory capability of, of all of us is limited. We probably cannot recall more than five to seven items after a short time. And our cognitive systems cannot really process too much information at the same time. For this reason, in the implementation of a face-to-face -face STDP, participants offer their contributions in a round-robin manner, giving others the opportunity to listen actively. Also, we do not allow any concept of power relations. The person who speaks the loudest in the room will not get any more time than the person who finds it more difficult to speak. Um, there is, and because there is no argument, uh, there is no way which one person can tell another person in the process that his ideas, he does not agree with his ideas. He can only ask for clarification. In the same way, participants do not compare four or five ideas at a time in the clustering and structuring phrases. They make simple binary comparisons, so they focus on only one relationship at a time. The next of our rules is saliency. Not all saliency, important, primary, prominent features are of equal importance. Therefore, we need to examine their relative saliency. In the clustering phase, we discuss and debate whether two factors have significant features in common to justify putting them together in the same cluster under the same heading. This process helps the participants to focus on features that distinguish two ideas, thus forcing them to discuss their relative saliency. Next one is requisite authenticity and autonomy. Here we are looking at things like groupthink um, and even clanthink. When a proportion of the participants follow and support certain ideas or arguments or simply remain silent out of fear of rejection or persecution by somebody with relatively more power. Clanthink is the extreme case of groupthink where practically all members of the group support an idea even though they know that it is outright wrong because otherwise they might be ostracized. And this, of course, is one of the challenges of bringing structured democratic dialogue into an organization, uh, commercial or academic, to discuss, for example, the subject like um, gender, um, um, gender equality. I mean, surely when one's taking the, the decision on gender equality in an organization, it's not logical or even moral to have the people in the room who are discussing what should be done to ensure gender equality in that organization, not to be the people who are most impacted by gender inequality, not the white old men aged 60 or less, 50, 60, 40, who are managing the organization and whose last experience of pregnancy was when their wives gave birth maybe 20 or 30 years ago, but rather the people who are working in that organization who are in the process of about, being about to give birth and being asked to work with hazardous materials in, in the place in their organization where they're working. Now, obviously, any organization discussing a subject such as gender inequality has problems of, of economics, what can be done and what can't be done. But in the process of a structured democratic dialogue, this comes out in terms of the ideas put into the pot by the people in the organization responsible for the budget. But it's also affected or impacted by the people who would need to have that budget applied to them in order to not be impacted by these kind of inequalities. Going back to authenticity and autonomy, during the clarification and clustering phases, um, others should be allowed to ask questions only about money, meaning no justification judgments allowed. This facilitation is intended to protect the autonomy and authenticity of participant so that no participant is discouraged and no idea is prematurely evaluated or rejected. Requisite meaning and wisdom. This law states that meaning and wisdom are produced during a dialogue only when observers search for relationships of similarity, priority, influence, etc., within the set of their observations. One way in which individual wisdom is externalized is the fact that when asked to select the most important ideas out of the total pool, participants generally do not choose their own. 
their own idea. Another takes place when following debates on a certain relation, they change their mind after having heard multiple arguments. And this we see as part of the process of the democratic dialogue. The evolution of learning. Ideas that have received high votes immediately after the classroom freeze, when we ask the participants to vote on the five most important ideas, um, we find that when we go to pro or pro progress through the process of comparing the ideas during the structuring phase, the ideas that come out at the root of our tree as being most influential or the ones that most impact the other ideas are never the ones that were chosen by the group when they voted on the ideas after they initially had been clarified. And this is something we call the erroneous priorities effect. This law stipulates, postulates, that participants learn through an evol evolutionary process that renders them capable of discovering the most influential factors only when they go through the process of exploring binary influences of one factor on another. And we have real experience of this happening. And requisite action. Parsimony, autonomy, and evolutionary learning assists people to achieve meaning and wisdom out of these largely cognitive processes. Actions emerge as natural consequences. And this is where the, the, we, we, we are basing this on this unethical to try and change the, the situation of people who are impacted by socio-economic or socio-cultural decisions if these people are not taking part in the dialogue. And also, where they're not involved in the dialogue, any attempts to change their lives will have a much higher risk of failure. The concept of the, of the consensus that we can produce from the structured democratic dialogue in any kind of situation means that even if people whose ideas were not at the top of the list when they were originally voted upon, can find from the consensus that comes out at the end, yes, my idea is there. It's not exactly as I said it, but I see it. It's been taken into account of in the, the output, in the map, in the action plan that comes out. So I'd like just to talk for a few moments, and then I will most definitely end in the project we did with the Bard College. Bard College is a, a, a liberal arts college in the United States where the Hannah Arendt Center is, is uh, located. It's also part of the Ocean Network, the Open Society University Network, which has many, many institutions all over the world. We were asked to undertake a, a structured democratic dialogue with participants who were students, um, academics, uh, university administrators and external experts on addressing racial, economic and educational inequalities through the university network. We have a large selection of participants and the triggering question which we developed was, what initiatives actions could the communities of the faculty, staff, students around the Open Society University network take that would contribute towards narrowing racial, economic, and educational inequalities. We had, I think, about 18 people who participated. There was one student who had a PhD, two who were master's students or second degrees, and 10 who were undergraduates. Two of the academics were professors, two were lecturers, and we had one administrator, one university administrator who was a member of the staff. But within our group, we had participants from the major universities within the Ocean Network, the European Central University in uh, Vienna, and also students who were enrolled as um, outs outs outside students in the barred colleges in, uh, in their countries where they were, but who were actually living in refugee camps. So we had a complete and very wide spectrum of people 
who participated in these debates. And you can imagine that, that perhaps people living in refugee camps, although the very fact that they actually applied to join this thing would show that they, they were interested, would find it more difficult to talk than professors. And we didn't, we didn't find that at all. Um, we had uh, 30% were male, 55% were female, um, smaller percentage were transgender. Um, of our participants, 33% um, were Asian, 27% were white, um, and 38.9% uh, were black or Afro-American. When we looked, when we started to process our ideas during the structured in the structured democratic dialogue, we first of all composed them into clusters or categories. And I don't want to go into detail of this, I just want to show you the map at the end. First one was missions and outreach. The second one was funding and scholarships. There we have five ideas. Educational resources and support, we have three. One which created a great deal of interest was community building. Uh, we had uh, eight. On the subject of democracy, we had fewer. Um, Advocacy and human rights, we had three. Accessible education, we had five. Employment opportunities, there were three. Empowering refugees, there were two. And raising awareness, there were three. When we carried out all of the processes and the structuring and the stepwise comparisons of ideas, we found that the ideas at the root of our map, and these are at the bottom, was where two. The first one was academic research resources. What did that mean? It basically said the, the, the participants decided that one of the ways of reducing inequality in, in the BARD and the ocean network, one of the most important ones, was allowing all students in the network to be able to access the academic research resources available to the highest level of universities which are part of the network. For example, the European Central University. Um, that was not available inside the BARD network. And therefore, people who were studying in, for example, in a uh, in a UFRFG camp were only having access to the library facilities in their local university. The second one was even more interesting, was stop requiring conventional English testing methods. Because a lot of the people applying to join the institutions which are part of the ocean network either did not have the funds or did not have access to the knowledge in order to go through conventional English testing. That wasn't to say that they shouldn't require some kind of level of proficiency in English, but that should perhaps start after they have been enrolled in the or in the institution rather than the beginning. Now there are lots of other, and you can see in the map there were lots of other ideas that came out, but these were the two ideas that came out at the at the at the bottom of the tree, at the top of the tree, as being the most the ones which had most influence on the other ones. And in the end of the day, the Ocean Network implemented the first idea. Now, they're still considering whether to implement the second one, but the academic research resources are now available throughout the network. Okay, let me stop sharing. Thank you very much. I trust I have not taken too much time and not not created too much confusion in what I was trying to say, but I'm very, very happy to open the debate up. And I would very much ex request the information of uh, the intervention of, of uh, uh, Federico and, uh, and everyone else in, in, in what we're talking about. And I see Federico has raised his hand. So please, Federico. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Marcus, for this big overview but also uh kind of in-depth voyage through the details of the structural democratic dialogue i found it really really interesting uh the the way the way you, you explain it also very extremely clear and and i like how how you, how you structured your, your your presentation in three parts ending up with a more with the most pragmatic implementation or attempt to uh, implement uh, some strategy which 
takes into account uh, the, the way Bruber thinks about dialogue. Um, while we, um, well, I, I, encourage, I encourage everyone to uh, either use the chat for questions or raise their hands, but um, since I don't see any other questions, I'd like to start maybe with um, something that I thought about while you were presenting. Um, and it's more of an, if you want, an, an anecdotal question, but I think that sometimes it could, it's better to start from the day-to-day -day experience or, or, or personal experience and then to abstract to the uh, theoretical level. Now, uh, the, the gist of your presentation was an attempt to put together to see how we can almost weld or, or intertwine some uh, principles from uh, um, the barbarian work and uh, problematic that you presented to us, like how to uh, conceive of decision making, if you want, uh, in, in a way that is uh, that is permeable to um, to dialogical practices. Um, so my my question is. Um, related to the last part of your presentation um so to to the examples that to the example you provided us but maybe you you have more um would you say that um you experienced yourself while you were there um either facilitating or taking part in this uh, in these dialogues either in the first part because uh so after the presentation of the ideas or just before the final voting, uh, maybe you can you can tell us about the difference in the kind of dialogues and in the kind of conversations that were taking part there, because I guess there must be uh, some sort of difference between these two different phases. Would you say you experienced what we might call this uh, with, with Buber, the, the mutual trust developing through uh, among participants um, the the presence of being like the genuinity of the being there or would you say that regardless of the medium like whether it was online or whether it was in in person there is a difficulty of feeling that like what what is your personal experience i'd, I'd start from there and then we can maybe go deeper into some more theoretical uh, questions Thank you, Federico. That's an excellent question. Um, but I'm, perhaps my experience is a little bit different because I was looking for that kind of development of trust. I, mean, I, 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 look, I came to structured democratic dialogue from looking of, for some way of, of, of in, in getting involved in relationships of trust on an, in an online basis. I mean, to some extent, you've actually achieved it with your seminars because I think some of us have developed relationships of trust, maybe not with everybody who's been at these seminars, but certainly being able to discuss uh, and to debate in, these, in this environment where, where it's not an adversarial environment, where we're each learning from each other, has certainly opened up things to me which I was not aware of before. But as you say in structured democratic dialogue, in the initial stage where we, we're, we're kind of collecting ideas and people are presenting their ideas, First of all, people are, are more reluctant to, to become involved and, and to, 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 to entertain discussion um, on, on, the, on, the, on the ideas themselves and on clarification of the ideas. And to some extent, we have to pull out the clarifications from, from the participants, even as we're going through this round robin process and allowing everyone to speak. Um, you know, some people have to be encouraged more than others. But, but certainly there are moments in this dialogue between the participants, and obviously only between a dialogue between one participant and another, where you see the spark, where they actually connect with one another and begin to understand one another. Uh, and and, and how, I mean, in the, in the, in the one with struck, when, in the one with Bard, um, I was to some extent uh, operating as a facilitator. But, but even as a facilitator, you begin to, dis to develop relationships with the participants. And we have, we have presented what we did in Bard a number of occasions, a number of forums, where people who were on working, were, were participants in it, have been only too happy to come on and explain their experiences. 
Now, one of the other things that happens that facilitates this in the process is people develop a shared language. As they go through the process of clarification of their ideas and the comparison of their ideas, they develop a shared language for discussing the topic, which they didn't necessarily have at the beginning. And this, this, this actually helps to develop that trust because people are not talking about the things which are totally different. And that comes out, that clarification comes out as part of the process. Again, there, there is no panacea here. STD does not create Bobarian relationships of trust, but it's a step in the right direction. And if we could develop a method, methodology of handling large scale structured democratic dialogue sessions, whereby the all of the work being done by computer, the computer, all of this building of matrices of ideas based on their the, the votes which they get and the way in which they're described, this would give us a, a great step up in combating the other kind of dialogue that goes on on the internet, which is a social media based one, which is a dialogue of, uh, of dissent and hatred and, and whatever else. Uh, but it's interesting that when we present this proposal to the European Commission in their funding ideas for funding new and, uh, and uh, emerging technologies, the adjudicators give us comments like, who needs it? <laughs> you wouldn't believe that, but that's the kind of comments we get. There's no demand for this. Of course, there's no demand for it. It hasn't happened yet, but it's really quite amazing. I, I, I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but I tried. Yeah, I mean, um, t tell me if I'm uh, oversimplifying by saying that um, we can conceive of a structural democratic dialogue as still pertaining to the world of I it, and nonetheless, uh, an I it out that, that could be potentially conducive to I thou relationships. Um, I mean, <laughs> With Buber, we, we, we can, uh, of course, um, acknowledge the necessity of uh, I hate relations to, to, to manage our world and the political realm, of course. Uh, 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 would you say that this is the relationship between SDD and genuine dialogue, Marcus? I yeah, think. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not trying to claim in any way that every participant in it, it, uh, envisages an I thou moment in his in his discussions or his interactions with the other participants, but it can happen, uh, and, and it's very important that if it can happen that we allow it to happen. Um, but yeah, absolutely, uh, STD itself is not um, is not the panacea for all. I mean, definitely not. I mean, one of our biggest problems in trying to persuade organisations to adopt the principle of STD is this problem that they cannot determine the outcome. And um, for example, we, we were working with, we were trying to work with the government in Scotland on the subject of um, freedom of information. They wanted to develop a new freedom of information regulation. And as soon as they discovered that, that they couldn't determine the outcome, even though everyone who had a say and had, had, a, had, a, had a, an iron in the, in the freedom of information debate would be participating. No, no, we weren't touching it because we would be then asked to do things which we as a government weren't able, weren't capable or didn't want to do. And, and what was what was so unfortunate about it was they could have joined that that dialogue, taking into account what they, what it is they, they, they were unable to do and explain that to the other participant. So rather than participants just seeing the government as the people were standing up and saying no, they would understand that there are security implications. There are other implications, legal implications, that the people who are coming with the ideas have to take into account. Um, but they, they don't want to take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see that SC has uh, asked to, um, to speak. Please. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you, Marcus. This was really interesting. Um, one thing that I was uh, thinking about when you were talking was that um, what is your what do you think um, if you think about the challenges and the possibilities of dialogue uh, in these uh, uh, processes uh, are they more due to um, technology or uh, other elements such as the time invested or the commitment of participants or the size of the community 
Um, so could you reflect a little bit on that, if you have some Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very interesting question. Obviously, there, there are but, um, building up concepts like structured democratic dialogue to involve large number of participants are all technology problems. And they're not totally soluble yet. I mean, it's not, this is not an AI solution. This is building um, mathematical matrices which can be manipulated of a very, very large scale, which is not generally done. Uh, the ISM, the Interactive Structural Modeling Algorithm, is really limited to, to a small number, 100, 120, 150 um, ideas. And to scale that up will be quite quite a challenge. But there also are organizational challenges. I mean, a lot of the citizens' assemblies which go on today are are where where citizens are brought together to examine ideas and make recommendations to the to the facilitator of the assembly. But there is no guarantee that these recommendations will be implemented. And I think that generally there is no undertaking that whatever is recommended will be implemented. And also, um, having a room full of 80 to 100 people who come up with a set of recommendations, the actual next step would be to, to take the 20 most active or most representative people in that room and move them into a structured democratic dialogue to examine what needed to be done to overcome, to identify the obstacles to implementing those recommendations and build an action plan to, to actually carry out the implementation. But that tends not to happen. The, the recommendations tend to be the end of the process. So there is definitely both an organizational constraint and technological constraints. Yes, uh, Vic, is that a raised hand? We can't hear you, Vic. Yeah, it's potentially a raised hand, yeah. just a raised hand. I, I was just thinking about the really interesting framing, Marcus, that you've delivered and particularly around the relationship between truth and trust, that a crisis in truth comes down to a crisis in trust. And partly what I've been thinking, the area where I've been thinking, writing, working around these questions and published on is to do with the Brexit debate in Britain, which I do know quite a lot about. But it seems to operate from the other way, which is, I was hoping to think about the breakdown or how are we supposed to think about the growth of populism and the breakdown of democratic trust or accountability that happened in Britain. So just giving slight background, there was a really important moment when over a million people in Britain took to the streets against the war in Iraq and the following day it was ignored. The Iraq war then happened, and there was a certain moment where not only of disillusionment, but a crisis of democratic accountability. There was a kind of awareness that most people in the community, or a lot of people, had said, no, stop, think, don't go ahead with this. And the government had the power to ignore it. And that was part of a longer process of a crisis in democratic accountability and in trust. And there was a moment in that where people stopped listening to Blair. There was the kind of moment where whatever he said, nobody listened to it. And there were kind of familiar moments in the present crisis in Britain to do with Johnson, that people are beginning not to listen to what he says. So it doesn't matter what he says, almost that they've kind of turned off. So. I was trying to focus on this relationship between truth and trust, where in the Brexit debate, there was a sense that all politicians were somehow in it together and couldn't be trusted. And at the same time, there was a growth in fake news and an idea that authorities couldn't be trusted. 
So there was this crisis that you've identified about um, the relationship between truth and trust and what happens in communities which have become radically divided or radically separated or polarized. And so I was kind of hoping that you were going to look at Israel-Palestine partly as a kind of, because you've, I know you've, I've heard you talk about that before. And that, that, there's a situation where these kind of larger questions um, come into play. And I was just slightly thinking that when the SDD thing, the Structured Democratic, came down to that example in Bard, I thought, well, there's some danger in thinking about ideas as if they're just discrete. You know, you talk about, let's take the best five ideas. When in fact, what we're trying to think about is how in the community, people are thinking in radically different kinds of ways. They're not just looking for, here are the ideas, which is the best, which is a kind of empiricist framing. But then they're, they're kind of talking through or against each other or not really listening to each other because of that deep crisis of trust. And that seems to be one of the really major questions in different societies that we're confronting. So I was hoping to push you back a bit from the example to these kind of larger questions that you raised in a really interesting talk, but then really narrowed it down to that Bard example. And I thought, well, yes, but so much gets kind of taken out before we get there. So many of the questions that Uber helps us think about somehow get instrumentalized, even though we're talking about Uberian dialogue. Thanks, Vic. Yeah, I, I, everything you're saying is absolutely true. Um, the I have talked about SDD with people involved in the peace process and also with um, uh, uh, people involved in the Irish peace process. And they kind of tend to say that in intra intractable, which one doesn't want to say that, but 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 uh, peace negotiations based on people having fixed views that they're not willing to open up to the other side um, and and open themselves up to changing their views. Even structured democratic dialogue will find it very difficult to work. I mean, I think you've seen that in the in the peace negotiations. And and uh, Paul, please correct me if I'm saying something I shouldn't hear. In in uh, in between Israel and Palestine, that on the very few occasions when the negotiators develop some kind of rapport, an understanding of the fears. The, 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 the difficulties which the other side was experiencing and associating themselves with that, I think it probably happened in the Taba negotiations. Um, they, they get much, they, can, they, they find it much easier to move forward. The politicians may not accept what they're doing, but in the end of the day, when the, the inter, interlocutors who are negotiating peace um, processes it establish relationships of trust, between themselves, then they can actually move forward. But without that, they can't go anywhere. Um, I mean, you, 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 again, you, you don't negotiate with friends, you negotiate with enemies. But if you cannot trust the people in the room in some way, then, then you really can't move forward. And I wonder to what extent also, um, you know, there was some kind of relationship of trust established between, between uh, Begin and, uh, and Sadat. Perhaps not uh, an I-thou relationship, but a kind of basic trust that they could believe the other, the other's motives. Maybe they were not the motives they wanted to hear, um, but but they could they could still trust them. Again, I don't know the answer to that, but I have been told by people involved in peace processes that that STD is already a level above. People have to come prepared to open up to each other. And, and without that, it can't happen. Uh, but I mean, I understand totally what you're saying about Brexit. I mean, I think really Brexit is is one of the the worst examples of, of self harm that any country has ever done to itself. Um, but but they, you couldn't talk. I mean, um, the members of my family who supported Brexit, there was no way to have a dialogue with them um, because everything was it's rubbish. Um, 
your 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 ideas are not correct. They're wrong. My ideas are correct. Um, and and that, and that seems to be some a place that we need to start from. So if yeah. we think about bottom, the danger is that the STD thing, even though it's framed as bottom up, mm -hmm. comes like even the way that you framed it. You framed it up, the negotiators in the room have to trust each other. So it's already operating at a particular kind of level. So if we're thinking of what happens in the communities, like the Northern Ireland situation is interesting because, because of the deaths on both sides in the community and the kind of civil rights movements that have emerged over the last so, 10, 20 years, there has been a kind of shift in politics in less sectarian direction shown in the recent elections. And there has been a kind of learning because of uh, the way that polarization led to such horrors and violence and deaths on both sides. And it was somehow a realization of the grief caused on both sides of the community that basically woke people up to wondering whether they could think differently or approach each other or then think about having schools which were non-denominational schools so at least the next generation would be um, educated in 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 a kind of different way in a, in a sense of shared community so the, the notion of when there's a polarization how you emerge out of it now that, that's an extreme example but, but I, I think it's a good example I because yeah. I, I discussed it with Lord uh, Alderdice, who was one of the proponents of the Good Friday Agreements. He studied, he teaches here in Oxford, and and he was actually drawing comparisons with Palestine and Ireland, and he was saying that the problem the problem in in Ireland was it was a religious conflict. So if you had the religious beliefs and the religious faith, it was very difficult to see the point from of from point. I, to look at it from the point of view of the other person in the room, because that's one of the things which 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 uh, trust and and dialogue requires. You have to be able to to put yourself in the place of the other. But the interesting thing that uh, Lord Alderdice explained to us was that one of the ways which the 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 protagonists came to came together in Ireland was the British government refrained from killing off the older members of the fighting community. So that as these people became towards the end of their lives and they were no longer firebrand um, idealists, they started to worry about their um, legacies. And they started to think about their children and their grandchildren. And they were more amenable to becoming involved in the kind of dialogue that was required in order to reach the Good Friday Agreements. And, and, and therefore, um, death, dis disseminating all of the people who eventually you can actually talk to because they're terrorists, because whatever. I mean, just the word terrorist already stigmatizes the other. And, 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 and how can you negotiate with someone you call a terrorist? Um, it's almost a kind of uh, contradiction in terms. But we insist on doing it because it's one way of that the politicians can keep the population in a state of fear. Um, but but I find the 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 Irish. Uh, system, I mean, I would love that STD could be involved in in that kind of process. But but I, I think we have to walk before we can run. Um, the, the, uh, and uh, and that's very much where we are at the moment. I suppose I, I suppose one of the questions I'm wondering about is whether that really interesting discussion about Ireland and what's happened there begins to reframe or question the SDD program a bit, you know, that there were different kinds of issues that are emerging around establishing the trust um, and the way that that emerges. And it might be like in, in, in Israel, Palestine, the, the the bereaved or the families of the bereaved on both sides where they've been able to come together has been the moment at which even though it's been very minimal it's been really important and significant so there's something about how is it if we're 
thinking through the question about the relationship of truth and trust, um, how how that relationship, you know, when trust is broken down, um, what's the process through which we can begin to think about um, recreating that trust? And it might be that the SDD thing operates at a certain level, like Bard or a particular institutional setting, but there are other issues about polarization, which you illuminated really well, but like, how do we then begin to operate in societies that are so polarized? So that in Britain at the moment, even questions around gender identity, you know, the gender identity is leading to violence in terms of the trans discussion. So the mode in which those discussions are happening, even around personal, private, and also public and social issues, how we produce a, certain, a different kind of dialogue and whether we can or how we learn from Buba to do that seems a really pressing issue. And, but I'm wondering whether it needs something else. Um, it, 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 it probably does because I've been finding great difficulty in the UK. Ah, one of the things I wanted to say before, STD seems to be attractive to younger people. There have been lots of STD um, applications with youth, youth in democracy, youth in African countries. They seem to see it as a way of being able to express themselves, which they no, may, might not necessarily have in another kind of environment, whereas adults are more fixed in their way, shall we say. Um, but what I was going to say to, to that was, um, I really, I really don't know how, how to move this further forward. And I have an admission to make. I mean, when I joined the STD community, I expected them all to be talking about dialogue, trust, Buberian concepts. And although they were all aware of Buber, they, they, they weren't really interested. It wasn't what, that wasn't the reason they were, they were doing STD. Um, and I've been trying to correct that since then, but uh, with some success, but not total yet. Um, uh, because it wasn't one of their main uh, focuses. Um, I, I became involved in, SD, in, in, in learning about Buber from my late father-in-law, who was a, a psychiatrist who taught uh, Buberian concepts to, to non, other denominations, non-Jewish denominations, um, in uh, clergymen in Scotland. And he introduced me to Martin Buber and Martin Buber's ideas. So I've been looking for a way of finding some way to actually tie that into what I do with IT for some time now. And then I came across STD. Um, but no, I absolutely agree with you. Now, the other thing is the triggering question. You could actually have a triggering question which says, how do we develop trust between um, participants who have no intrinsic trust in each other. What do we have to do to create an environment where they actually start to begin to trust them? So, I mean, you can use it at any kind of level, um, uh, and 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 framing the the framing the, the the triggering question and who you invite to the dialogue are really the key elements in it being successful. Sorry, could I just interrupt? There was a question somebody asked about the map saying it was a large cluster of community building um, and asked me to explain what was in there. Yeah, um, just quickly, can I go? There were, there were one, two, three, four, eight of the ideas um, that came out were in community building. Um, uh, I, think, I think community building was seen again by the younger people involved in the dialogue. Um, voluntary training about inequalities was one of the ideas. Um, community building in, in general was proposed. Effective pressure group, I think that was pressure group of the students on the academic uh, uh, institution. Empowering youth, funding operations for grassroots work. That was having um, the university when it needed volunteers to, to help with grassroots activities to actually be prepared to pay them something for that. Um, Capacity building for organizations and an institute for activism. Those were amongst the ideas that came out of the community building group. Thanks, Marcus. I don't know whether you and I have some comments on this or if you're happy with the question, <laughs> with, the, sorry, with the answer. Uh, 
Okay, I see that Johan has a raised hand. So yeah, please. Thank you, Marcus. I think this was very, very fascinating. And it's a really fundamental question that we are uh, thinking about, in my view. Um, how does Buberian dialogue relate to the realm of the political or the realm of the social, the social political? I think you drew that distinction also very, very, very carefully. But um, I always take Buber to be talking about something that's not political and not social. And um, and he and he, he he says that you know there's the interhuman and there is the decision menschliche and then there is the social relations and they are different. Although Vic and I have been quarrelling about this for a very long time, um, it's not it's not so so easy. But I think that he's trying to, to talk about this this what you also emphasize this moment of uniqueness or a recognition of the individuality of the people in the relationship, and in a way so. In a way, that gets activated in uh, the way I understand your, your the framework of SDD. That gets activated in the in the, in a process of so you get to better decisions or to better actions or to more understanding and therefore to a higher level of democratic, uh, higher carrot of of, of democracy um, by paying attention to these sorts of things. And in that sense, I think that that seems to me to be very important sort of practical aspect of having these kinds of dialogues because um, it is a place where people can bring things that they might not be able to bring in in other contexts. And um, so, uh, but, but at the same time, there are also, uh, so and I think in, that's how I sort of conceptualize this for myself as, as you were talking. That there, are, so there are also things that, well, I want to raise briefly three things. One is this point of the, right at the beginning of the process, there is this invitation and who to invite and who, who should be part of it. Well, so I don't know really how to put it out of words, but isn't there something in the Buberian dialogue that is not about invitation, but that is about uh, interruption? Uh, you are, the, the, the basic Levinasian point of view, you are confronted with another in 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 your life and uh they don't invite themselves or you don't invite them they're suddenly there and then you have to deal with them or you know listen to them or acknowledge or they have to acknowledge you or um and that seems to me also to be part of the political sphere in that sense that we don't just as we don't choose our family we don't choose the the people that we live with in in our communities um so how how does that how does that well, what happened in a, in a moment of invitation was something that that really interested me, and um, and the, the other point had to do with uh, what you said right in the beginning. This difference between uh, we talked about already, but I'm wondering if you say, could say a bit more. This difference between being physically present and um, uh, communicating online, especially then this the point that you made about the Buber's letter writing in, in distinction to uh, email writing today. How do you see that, that difference? Is there possibility for dialogue in email? What is the difference between email and letters? I think that's something that I find very, very fascinating. And there was a, oh yeah, the third point had to do with that you said so, um, structural democratic dialogue is um, a contemporary version of the of the Greek agora, and um, I, I don't think there was a lot of uh, recognition of each other's individuality in uh, the agora. So I wonder how you uh, how you see that. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the invitation, I think you're absolutely right. Um, um, but I think the kind of um, people being in the room face to face who don't know each other occurs when they start to go through the structured democratic dialogue process. But certainly not at the level of invitation, because we have it some way to try and, and apply the rule that we will have enough viewpoints and difference in the room to, to make the dialogue work. Having a structured democratic dialogue with a group of like-minded individuals is less useful. In fact, the more, the more conflict that they bring to the table, the more useful it can be. Although we have done, from the practitioners of structured democratic dialogue, we have done work on, I mean, SDD started in the Club of Rome, sorry, um, in the Club of Rome.
part of Rome in the 1970s. That's where the idea came from, from people like Warfield, who was involved in, in what kind of future for humanity, kind of tried to develop a way of, 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 of narrowing down the, the, the myriad of, riot of ideas and, and pro propositions into something that was manageable. And, and the practitioners have carried on doing retrospectives on the ideas of the Club of Rome, even though they are like-minded in order to kind of find where, where today the most important elements of society that could help to change the situation we're in at the moment. And the, the, I, I can share with you the, the latest report that we've actually produced on that, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we can overcome the in, invitation aspect other than if we had this thing working on the web where people could say, well, I would like to, do, to have a dialogue on the subject and people could, could want, wish to join. The way in which we do it at the moment, we try to, to, to kind of classify people so that we will have a wide variety of people with differing views and opinions and backgrounds in the room at the dialogue. And obviously, the face-to-face the -face dialogue is different from the online one. Because in the face-to-face -face one, people have people can drink coffee together, people people meet out with the process, and can also establish relationships. And establishing relationships with trust is much faster if you're in a room together with people for a whole day, than 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 four or five sessions, internet sessions. But it but it seems to happen over internet. We can do it. The question of email and dialogue is something which I am fascinated by because I don't know. I think other people in the room are more are more qualified to talk about that. I mean, when one sits to compose an email where one wants to put over a viewpoint, but taking into account the viewpoint of the others, then perhaps one are one is involved in some kind of dialogic process. Um, but when one writes an email to to uh, because one's annoyed with something, and, and and a lot of the problem with emails are people's people who can speak to you very calmly uh, on, a, on an interchange when they write an email because it's not their native language for all sorts of reasons they write it very abruptly and it looks as though it's actually um, antagonistic when it's not that's just the way it came over. So I think e emails are very, very difficult, but I don't know if there's a comparison between letter writing and email uh, in terms of uh, participating as I, or even if people considered that letter writing was a, a form of dialogue, was a was, was continuing a dialogue. Regarding the Agora, the, the, the Athenian Agora, um, I think the, 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 the idea of the Agora was just that people um, Anyone who could participate in that, and they could be chosen, or they could they could volunteer, they they could be part of it. And the idea of of this STD on, on online was that anyone could 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 propose a subject for a dialogue, and other people could say, yeah, I would I would like to. That's a subject of interest to me. I mean, today when you when you put that kind of thing, okay, I want to have have a debate on or a discussion over internet on on subject. Really, there's no structuring to it. it it's very unstructured. And, and therefore, there's no real way of reducing the, 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 the number of combinations of ideas, of approaches, of ways of doing things. And the, the structuring of STD, the, the algorithms in STD enable one to actually achieve that. So the debate can be, can, can be more effective. Sorry, I don't think I did that very well. No, but... no, no. Thanks very much. That, that, that's, that's very, 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 very helpful. I think especially that, that first point about the invitation, that's, of course, in, in the online context, I agree with you that um, there is a kind of uh, you, you just, yes, anybody can say, say something or anybody can make a point and can interrupt in, in a process. And in that sense, that's a very important thing there. But, yeah. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Um, Thank you. What, what sticks with me is the relation between truth and trust. And uh, as you outlined it, in the context of a spoken dialogue, um, it is based on faithfulness with respect to existing reality, the person addressed and the speaker. And what, what this reminded me of um, was Honora O'Neill's uh, approach to trust, um, where she would say, um, first of all, we have to work on our own trustworthiness. And I wonder whether we could, could do something similar in relation to this dilemma or this yeah, 
this <laughs> notorious problem, um, how can we raise trust between people who don't trust each other? So could we maybe, first of all, try to, to think about what would I like another people, another person, how would how would I like another person to be in order for me to trust this other person and then try to <laughs> work with myself? And, and also what, um, what has been emphasized several times, it's decisive that we listen to each other. And, and how can we become a good listener? And uh, for me, this also has to do with, with a certain form of hospitality. Um, and, and there's an example which is, <laughs> which is not historical, um, but I have a friend who is a church historian, uh, Katharina Haydn, who has done research in how to establish dialogues in conflict situations. And uh, she has done this in regard to Switzerland, where it, it, it is um, told that um, Swiss democracy was established upon the two parties fighting um, when they stopped at the front and met for a lunch and at this Swiss uh, milch suppe. <laughs> and then upon eating together, they could speak to each other um, after a certain silence. And, and although this is not historical, <laughs> I think this legend has something valuable to, to say about how people can, can come closer to each other. What, what, what do you think about this suggestion? I, I think your idea of, of developing trust, how one can develop trust between people is, 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 is fascinating. And how, how can one do that when, when, when a lot of the distrust is perhaps because of fear? I mean, if we could develop trust between Palestinians and Israelis um, bottom up, then, 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 then things would be totally different. And then actually it does happen. But it doesn't permeate throughout society. Uh, I mean, what 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 I found from 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 I mean, I, I I lived in Israel for forty years, and I I am now working since I stopped living in Israel temporarily. I'm now working on a project with Palestinian um, students um, for the European Training Foundation, which was supposedly to be based on structured democratic dialogue, but it's ended up not not yet to be on that. But I find they are, they are so much similar, so similar to Israeli students of a similar age that it's, they're almost indistinguishable. But, it, but, but again, as soon as you get older, then the fear comes back in uh, and, 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 and everything is clouded. The lack of, the lack of uh, trust is, 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 is horrendous. Um, but, but I really don't, I don't, I don't really have any answers how to, how to, how to create trust where no trust exists. I mean, your example of Switzerland was, was a very good one. But I understand also in the second, in the First World War, I think at one Christmas, um, the, the, the troops on both sides downed arms and went and had a Christmas lunch together. And then went back to, to shooting each other immediately afterwards, uh, which, I mean, I find kind of very, very strange to understand. Uh, I mean, nobody, after they had the lunch together, thought, well, maybe we should stop this. Um, but but it, it didn't happen. Um, so I, I really don't have any kind of good ideas how, how one can, can generate trust uh, where it doesn't exist. Hey. Try, to, try a typical European uh, family Christmas lunch. <laughs> can I briefly jump in if there's no Please. other... Because I, I was also uh, intrigued by, by this uh, relationship that uh, indeed exists between trust and, uh, and, and truth. And to dive a bit or to dig a bit more into, into this, probably uh, we should start distinguishing different levels of mistrust. Because one thing is the situation of war that you uh, presented um, the se several situations of war uh, in which one's own life is at risk. That is the extreme fear, extreme mistrust. I mean, if I, if I don't know whether I'd be stabbed or killed, that is probably the most difficult situation. So that is the extreme. But there are other forms of uh, distrust. Uh, for example, you mentioned distrust or mistrust in, in institutions. Like, would I trust a politician 
that I voted uh, that he's going to carry out what his program has been, or what he presented in his program, for example. And this is another kind. Or when we talk about the polarization in our societies, and, and uh, I was struck by your uh, by your um, another anecdote, <laughs> talking about some, someone who was a Brexiteer and trying to talk about Brexit with, with someone from your own family. And I think that, I mean, unless we are, uh, we have a very politicized one-sided family, it, it happens that there is a relative with a completely different political point of view, political stance. Now, uh, so first differentiating different levels of mistrust need different answers, of course, because for example, in the, in the case of, of war, um, safety and security and ceasefire, they are not trust, but there are essential conditions for trust, for, for starting an attempt. In the case of someone who uh, is, I'd say, ideologically stiffened into its own position, um, so a milder uh, form of mistrust, I'd say that a point that you touched in your, in your presentation is crucial and that you touched upon the point of, di of, of language. And I was also struck at the end of your presentation where you said, oh, the participants in these SDD processes, they developed a mutual language. And sometimes in the polarization of our societies, I find that it's precisely, or one of the ways we can address it is a completely different usage of words, a completely different um, and opposed, um, I'd say, um, yeah, always um, uh, almost a manipulation of the words that the other one is using, twisting and turning them uh, to to our own means. That is an ideological use of language, an instrumental use of language. So for these, so to say, milder forms of of, of distrust, one first step could in fact come from a form of um, uh, of deconstruction of language, of addressing and, 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 and maybe breaking this stiffened, uh, this stiffened word formation, the stiffened conceptualizations and understanding of words as a, a first step, as a past destruence. And then after showing the, uh, even the shattered pieces of the meaning that we bestowed on them before, then we can reconstruct a common language, and then that could be conducive to a form of trust. That is uh, a way I think it is possible to do it at, at a personal level, like when I, when I engage in conversation with someone with whom I, I don't share the opinion, for example, that I find it useful for, for me as well as for the other person to start from agreeing at least on the meaning of, of, of words. Um, it is an analytical point, but it's not just something that happens on um, a cognitive level. It, 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 it also involves what I'd call the emotional side, because some words immediately trigger some emotional responses in certain situations. And I think that delving into the emotional responses that specific words that are connotated um, uh, arise in, in several speakers is probably the first step to put ourselves in the in the feet of the other you know? and, and, and this way start developing um, a potential um, relationship of trust. I don't know whether you find it too naive or, or, or convincing uh, this, this first step. Uh, no, no, I, th I think it's very true. I mean, we were talking about family members and not agreeing over Brexit. I have a bigger problem with family members not, not agreeing over the Israeli-Palestine conflict, um, in which I am almost um, I'm alone in, in, in my views, but I have worked very hard to, to, to try and establish a language we can talk about it that, that doesn't make us immediately antagonistic towards one another. Um, but it requires a great deal of effort um, because um, asking them to, to consider the other with compassion, sympathy, awareness, um, 
with, 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 with at the level of mistrust that tends to be of, uh, in the community, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right, the language that we, we, we use and, and how we listen to each other in these situations is, is critical. I mean, one of my, uh, I, I originally thought that perhaps SDD, SDD might be a way that the, um, the Jewish community in a country like Britain could, under, could begin to understand that there, there is a problem with the way in which um, the Palestinians inhabitants of, the, of Israel have been treated. Um, that, they, that, that, that there is an issue, rather than they're out to push us into the sea and nothing about, we can't, no, that's it. Um, uh, how do you make that, how do you get that kind of change? May I sit? Please, please. I, I, don't, I don't know how to use the, cut my, I don't have a computer, but I'm using an iBook, I don't know how to get this intervene, but there's a concept I think that could help clarify uh, the discussion. In philosophy, one speaks of universe of discourse, which has been suggested. The universe of discourse, of course, is a shared language on emotive and semantic levels, as well as what we call horizons of expectation. Um, and they, of course, vary. So uh, the grammar of trust would suggest that one has to create a, a universe of discourse. And I'll, I'll just throw that out. But I wanted to pick up something that uh, Claudia, my, my beloved friend, <laughs> as noted, and that's the learning to listen in silence. Many, many years ago, I had a Bedouin friend who asked me if I could accompany him because I, I had a car, um, if I can accompany him to the Israeli desert to buy a herd of sheep from a, another tribe. And this Bedouin lived in the, what we call the West Bank and went deep into the desert. I had no way of understanding where we were going, but he was able to distinguish <laughs> The, the crests and such of the, of the, the desert. And finally we arrived at the, at the encampment of, the, of, the, of those who were to sell uh, she, uh, sheep. And we sat in the tent and for more than an hour, no one said anything. And I being a, a Westerner felt that's just my problem <laughs> with my speaking. But after an hour I realized they were creating through the silence, a shared space, an emotional space, even a somatic space. Um, and that I think was deeply instructive of how we perhaps can least sow the seeds of, of trust, the, the, the shared silence. Um, and words, of course, do mean a lot of our, our baggage, but there's a great deal of emotion, of difference, of expectations, ideologically inflicted, um, and conflicts are real. You noted that. There's a real conflict between Jews and <laughs> the Israelis, Jews and the Palestinians. Um, and it's not to be dismissed. It's the question of what you refer to the Truth and Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm presently engaged, but at least the time to develop with Palestinian friend, a, the outlines of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Israel, you know, the brute facts is that of the 470 Arab villages in, in 1948 were depopulized, uh, depopulated by the Israelis, expelled. Um, and <laughs> but the Palestinians would feel the, <laughs> the pain and, and abuse and anger and the resentment is real. Uh, the conflicts are real, but initially create some sense of a universe of discourse on all levels, language, and motion, as Federico mentioned before, and somehow to share <laughs> the somatics, somatics, the feelings of the body of that, that we are ultimately we uh, are fellow human beings. That hour or so that I spent with the Bedouins, very I didn't, I didn't I speak very rudimentary Arabic, <laughs> and I'm clearly from a different world. Um, yet that hour of, of just sitting together without making a word just allowed us to recognize one another as existentially as fellow human beings, and that of course is is a sine qua non of of dialogue. Um, but it's a challenge, and you very well uh, articulated it. But creating that universe of discourse in, in all its subtlety and nuance is crucial. That's a lovely example. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. That's Thank a great example. Uh, it's also there that uh, you, it was out of friendship, and it was also, there was the silence, but there was the willingness of you to walk together. You walk together with a friend.
from a different world right. and you were willing to do that and you did that journey and then that time of silence is a time of establishing trust. I had one question that was left from Marcus's thing, which was Marcus mentioned this and said I wasn't sure he wasn't sure whether he knew how to think about it. I think it's a really helpful question. Which was that in the Hebrew there is a link between um, between truth and the notion of trust. And that might be there in a biblical tradition because of that connection. So I this is, I mean, Johan knows much more about this than I am, but I'm wondering what in the Greek or Greek Teutonic Christian tradition, what is that relationship between truth and trust? So let's talk about a universe of discourse or the grammar of trust. One of the things to do is to be aware of how different cultures produce and sustain different grammar. But that's just a question. So just within our own little group here, I was wondering about what different cultures and different histories and different languages, what is that relationship between them? I, I was very impressed when I discovered that in Hebrew, but I wasn't sure then how to talk about it in a kind of interfaith context with Christians or Muslims as to whether that was a, a shared Abrahamic or it was very different within Christianity. And, and Marcus mentioned that the idea of trust created through a, you know, a, a shared sense of propositions, you know, like the Catholic um, proposition that you have to subscribe to in order to be seen as a believer. So I, I just think those, I'd just be interested in people's different responses in our group about different religious traditions and what that relationship is. But I suppose it's an open question to everybody. And before we address that, I see that Claudia has a raised hand and we are also ending the session. I'm happy for staying here five minutes more, 10 minutes more, uh, but I understand that it, we are also running short of time. So Claudia, if you want just to very briefly make a comment and uh, yeah, please. Yes, it's in fact exactly about this issue um, interfaith um, um, dialogue. And um, as an aside, Marcus, you mentioned Buber's description of faith in Judaism as trust, while he described the Christian uh, faith as belief. Um, and, and thereby, I think he reduces Christianity to a doctrine. And, and um, if you look, for instance, at Martin Luther or Ulrich Zwingli, the big reformers, how do they, how do they describe faith? There's one Latin word, and I put it in the chat too, which is fiducia. And this is nothing else than trust in an affective way. It's very affective emotion-based relation to God. So, so I think Buber here <laughs> has somehow um, put a cliche um, into the world um, when, uh, when, dis when distinguishing Christianity and Judaism in, in, in these ways. Um, and, and here is um, the book that I wanted to show because there's the story that Paul just described with the Bedouins. It's in this book and it's edited by Aslau Christiansen, who is also in our group today. It's a wonderful book. I can re recommend it. Uh, the title mm -hmm. is Attending to Silence. What is the title of the book? Attending to silence, ah, okay. and it's mm -hmm. interdisciplinary with philosophers, with um, um, educationists. So I, I can really recommend this warmly. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks. Uh, I don't know whether. Uh, Let me say, is that true? <laughs> that is, is it true that I mean? I know you claim this that Buba that gets it thing, but I, I, I'm still struck that there's a real difference between the, the relationship to trust and truth. I know in the Danish philosopher Lustrup, he has really interesting discussions about trust as which are, uh, the echo. He, I don't think he knew Buber, but I don't think, I think the, there's still the contrast that Buber is making about belief or shared belief. Um, is still true, is still strong and true. I think he's pointing to something real rather than cliche. 
but I'm just going to defend that. I just, I, I'm just saying that, but I don't know whether that's true. So I wonder what Paul's take on that is, or because I thought some of these distinctions, yeah. you can, un, you know, some of these interfaith distinctions, it's really important to mm. recognize the differences in mm. order to produce trust, as opposed to say, no, these differences are kind of unreal or it's, it's a misreading of Christianity. I would or just say, or there are reformers in Christianity, like Swingley and Luther, who, who didn't take this. I would just simply alert one, that, and I think Judaism is as guilty as this is as other faith relations, what we call supersessionism. We have the truth, we have access to the right way to God, and you lack it. Um, and that is a, a fundamental barrier often between faith communities, what we call supersessionism. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that has to be obviously. Considered. On the other hand, we have to respect the fact that others do have faith commitments based in some sense of of, of truth, uh, existential truth, religious truth, um, and and that makes the issue uh, cannot be simply dismissed by saying that's supersessionism. Uh, but we have to understand that that dynamic in order to uh, bridge um, the um, the faith realities of various of various religious communities. Um, and it's, I, I'd reinforce that. I think there's the way that supersessionism within Western culture has also been there and structured the relationship between faith and science. That's right. the notion of science is somehow replacing or reason replacing right. faith in some way. That certainly, that was quite central to the, to my, to the work I did in Ethical Humans, you know, the book mm -hmm. I did here was basically right. trying to show how that structure of mm -hmm. professionalism isn't simply a feature of differences between theological traditions, but it's very it's there in the shaping of Western culture in, in its sense of itself as more advanced or more modern or more progressive. It's Certainly. very deeply set, both in Kant yeah. and in, in Descartes and in, in other traditions. Yeah. And Buber is really important in helping us question some of that, even if Buber's not doesn't get it all, but he opens it mm. up at least as an issue, as do other yeah. Jewish thinkers, you know, as mm. other, other thinkers have done. Yeah, well put. Yeah. This would be a great discussion for us to have because yeah. we have all these yeah. differences in the group. Mm -hmm. And that would be a really interesting thing to when we come together in September or whatever, to kind of try and take a next step yeah. in our assessments yeah. of and if anybody wants to write on it, that's what we're trying to also make a, an issue in the uh, European Judaism. We're trying to encourage yeah. people to take on. It's a way of perhaps uh, suggesting, not a conclusion, but a promise of, of a continuation. There was an Israeli poet, a Hebrew poet, Abu Kovna, um, who um, was dying of cancer and he's, he came to the United States at a hospital that's claimed to be the most advanced in, in, de, in, in treating cancer. It's called Sloan Catering. And he wrote a series of poems in Hebrew uh, with the title Sloan Catering. And the last poem that he wrote just before he died was, one more question, please, turning to God, before you take me, one more question. And then ultimately, that's the nature of, uh, of, of dialogue, is to, to honor our questions and to continue the question. Um, so uh, the questions remain open, <laughs> um, and we'll con and that is an invitation to continue. I think, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a very beautiful beautiful uh, remark, and it sort of links back to Marx to your point that truth is an occurrence and it's not something that you possess. It's a right. it's reality. All right. And, well put. And, sorry, Paul. Well, well, no, that's well put. Yeah, <laughs> and and it links to trust in that sense as the, the trust that there will be another question yeah. um, or that there will be an opportunity for another question mm -hmm. and in that mm -hmm. sense you can say so in a kind of common sensical understanding you would say the moment you lie you people don't trust you anymore mm -hmm. um, but but here it's a, that's true at that level but at the level of the openness of question and answer trust is the trust that there will be Another another question, or that that it will will continue, and in that sense, I think the remark about Honora Neal is very very relevant. Uh, that where, where she says, well, you know, what can we do to be to to be trustworthy? Um, 
that's not some kind of taskmaster discipline or so that needs to be uh, that we need to need to to work, labor under. But it is, um, I think, the paradoxically speaking, the recognition that we maybe are not very trustworthy to begin with, and in and I think maybe that's where this Christian point, uh, or I, I think it's in Uber, it's the same comes in. Ultimately, our trustworthiness is derived from the fact that God is the one who is always <laughs> trustworthy, just as God is the one who is always Tao. Um, and, and God has unconditional trust in us, no matter, I've said this before, no matter how often we mess up, uh, he still has trust in us. <laughs> uh, try, try that in, the, in, in daily life. <laughs> with other people you know <laughs> it's not going to work so then i think we need to recognize that the basis of trust is in that sense something that lies outside of us uh in that relation to the transcendent reality and then we can we could give meaning to trust in in that sense and that's how also to come back to vic's question about the greek origin of this i don't know very much but but i think that in in, in sort of the greek conceptual schema there is this pistis faith which is uh, the trustworthiness of the speaker that they will that they will come good on what they say, that you can trust what someone says. So that's a category, mm-hmm. it's a rhetorical category of ethos that becomes in in Paul's letters becomes the Christian notion of, of faith. Yeah, right. Well put. Thanks, Joran, for these final remarks, and thanks, Paul, again for uh, sharing the. Uh, the story of this Israeli poet. Uh, and I think that with this, um, we can uh, wrap this session up, uh, which was extremely interesting. And uh, I, I thank you all for your uh, contributions to the dialogue. And thanks, of course, Marcus, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, I and Johan will be um, in touch with you with uh, what comes next and with the details for the um, issue, special issue for the European uh, ju- uh, Judaism. Um, sorry, for the Judaism. Uh, European Judaism. Judaism. <laughs> yeah. Judaism that we are uh, uh, co-editing. So um, thanks, uh, everyone, and um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.